approaches to experimentation and measurement are, are super important for kind of figuring out what's working and what isn't on uh, with respect to your, your data science team in terms of kind of real results, actual data, and, and using that to, to inform your model, measuring across different uh, KPIs and that sort of thing, and, and measuring a lot of things at once. There's, there's a lot of complexity that comes from that that sometimes gets overlooked in the excitement of building a good model, but this is kind of how you show business uh, that your thing is good, that you can show it in real values that they understand, and that you can also use those those real values of interest to, to improve your model. So there's lots of benefit that can come from that, and there's a lot of really fun, interesting approaches and problems uh, that, that come from that as well. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Defo Data Channel podcast. I'm your host, Deepak, and with me, we have Vanessa Pishande. Vanessa is a data scientist at uh, Sobeys in Toronto, specializing in statistics, machine learning modeling, and developing productionalized ML systems on the cloud platform. With her expertise in MLOps best practices, she'll be shedding light on the power of measurement and experimentation in the industry. It's a pleasure to have you here today, Vanessa, and uh, thank you for accepting my invitation. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Great. So I have a couple of questions lined up and like I'm going to start with this. So can you explain the importance of measurement and experimentation in the industry and how does it impact decision making and overall business scenario? Yeah, so I guess I'll start by kind of defining what that is. It's kind of, I don't know, I have my own kind of working definitions for these. Uh, and I look at it as dividing measurement and experimentation into two kind of separate things. Uh, they're kind of two stages of the same process. So uh, this will, by the way, sometimes be called A-B testing in business, but I prefer, again, experimentation and measurement because it's a lot more general and kind of implies, you know, you can test a lot of things at once. So experimentation is kind of the phase one. So it's where we decide what we're testing, for how long, on who, that sort of thing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's running the experiment, kind of like assigning kind of uh, variants of whatever you're testing, you know, A and B, et cetera, to different subjects. These can be people or your stores or th those sorts of things. It can be any sort of unit, essentially, of, of measurement. Um, and then uh, the, or yeah, unit of, I guess, I don't know, experiment, I guess, because measurement would be after the experiment's completed. So you've kind of run that for a period of time that, you know, you decide that's kind of part of that experimental design period. Um, and then you have results and you want to use this data to make uh, decisions. You want to measure maybe certain KPIs. You want to know what variants are performing better than each other with respect to these different KPIs. And uh, we also want to know, like, is the test working? How accurately can we trust this? You know, uh, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, we want to be able to basically extend and extrapolate upon these results, come up with different, uh, yeah, I guess, measures of effectiveness between them, comparisons, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so in terms of where that becomes important in industry and the impact on decision making. So they, and like in things like academics and science and that sort of thing, they've been doing this for a long time, right? Kind of that experimental process of, of data gathering and um, uh, then eventually, after, you know, running the experiment that after the experiment is, is completed, you do some form of statistical analysis to come up with conclusions over the results. And that's often what you publish. I mean, it's definitely not every paper and everything or, you know, but there's definitely a lot of those, right? And um, that's kind of uh, in business. That's also something that's been done in the past. Uh, but uh, from what I've been, you know, observed and heard, this is definitely far less consistently and far, with far less rigor. And in some cases, rightfully so, far less rigor than, than academia because the, the stakes are different. Um, and what I can say from experience is if you use these tools correctly, you can gain a lot of insightful information that really you wouldn't be able to drill down into otherwise about what's working, maybe why it's working, who it's working on. Um, if you can take a, a really kind of regimented approach to this, you can kind of take advantage of businesses' flexibility uh, as compared to, you know, academia because, you know, you can try different things and, and the stakes in, in most businesses, in most lines of business, I'll, I'll say some, you know, there's definitely some businesses that deal with 
high stakes activity and that sort of thing. But in anything like I've been in retailer advertising is kind of the data I've worked in in both um, in my career experience. The stakes are a bit, you know, lower. Uh, so that gives you more room to experiment, try different things on different people, that sort of thing. Um, and typically the other challenge with business is the scale of the data tends to be quite large. Um, uh, if you're like a large kind of nationwide or multinational in some cases, corporation. So yeah, the idea is you can kind of get quantifiable results and make kind of conclusions and decisions from those, those results. You can say things like, I'm X percent sure that version A is better than version B based on an experiment. And on average, I can say, you know, I'm going to make Y dollars more from version A than B or our return on investment or it's going to be this much more or our cost is going to go down, you know, all sorts of these KPIs you can measure with respect to your experiment and you can do that reliably if it's well set up. Right, right. So in this regard, could you share some of the examples of how a scalable and adaptable measurement framework can benefit business and how does it help them stay agile in a rapid changing scenario? Yeah, so I guess I'll, to kind of provide the example, I'll go through a little bit of my, my with my current role is um, at Sobeys, which is a Canadian grocery retailer. And we do kind of, we have a loyalty program uh, through Scene is the name of the, the loyalty card or whatever. I think it's only a Canadian thing. But uh, the idea is, you you know, redeem points for groceries, that sort of thing. And we have personalized offers available on the apps for the different grocery banners, whatever. And the idea is, yeah, these offers are direct to consumers. So that's kind of what my team kind of does is we make these personalized offers kind of a recommendation system sort of problem. So we want to measure the effectiveness of, you know, there's obviously a lot of room for creativity, variance, different numbers of offers, types of offers, variance of offers. You know, you have buy this much, get this many points, uh, you know, across the whole thing. You have product offers that are, you know, you buy this product, you get this much. You know, and how many offers do we give to each customer? What's the richness of those offers? Who do we give richer offers to? Those are the types of questions that uh, we can answer with measurement. So there's kind of two audiences, at least in, in my case, for, for these types of results, because there's kind of the people, and I think this would be in general, the, uh, you know, most business cases, is there's people who are just look who are actively involved in the system you're trying to measure and can then kind of go in and do interventions, uh, change the system, update it, et cetera, to, based on your measurement, right? And in some cases, too, that, that closing of the loop can be automated. We aren't there yet, but that is something, again, but the idea is for us, you know, that would be our data science team on our, our personalization team who's looking at things and saying, okay, this is what we're going to maybe try this week or this is working, this isn't working, um, and just overall to, like, the, the system kind of, not even making it a machine learning problem. Of course, there is a machine learning problem at the core, but there's a lot of heuristics, hard rules, you know what I mean, that you do need to create cutoffs for. Things like, yeah, the number of offers or like, you know, the uh, different kind of ways we divide customers, even different inputs into our machine learning model. There's all sorts of interesting things we can divide our, our experiments across. So that's kind of audience one. And of course, having more information in that regard will make our model because we're measuring it right in terms of these different KPIs and that we're able to then basically tune our model towards these different KPIs. And I, I'll just point out to, I guess, the other people who are kind of aware with hearing the, the term model tuning. I, I kind of, this is separate from that or, or model um, kind of evaluation or testing or that sort of thing. Uh, this is more, I would say system tuning. It looks at the system holistically um, and it's it's done not just using the test set, like after you've trained the model sort of thing, you run that specific model, that specific part of the model, and you see, okay, is this, you know, accurate with regards to my test evaluation set in terms of the metric? This is checking, is are we actually deriving value? Are we deriving dollars? Are we saving money? Are we getting more people to our stores, to our website, et cetera? And then, so that's kind of the first audience is the data science. And then this for us. And then the second one is kind of the, the larger business layer where they're not really interested in, in all cases, sometimes they are interested in specific nitty gritty details of what the experiment is. There's definitely some experiments we do run that are somewhat requested uh, from external to our team. But more often than not, in, in our case, too, because we're a newer team still trying to like 
you know, show our value and, and that sort of thing. We want to show them how much money is this system generating? How much, uh, you know, how much, how many more people are coming to the store because of the system? Let's approximate that and, uh, and use that to kind of, uh, yeah, make decisions. And eventually we can, you know, branch off from just hopefully comparing like our thing versus the absence of the thing. But if you're in a case where you are wanting to prove that, that that's, that can be helpful. Um, and also, uh, looking to kind of, yeah, see kind of what's working, what's not, uh, from those kind of higher level cases where they're not maybe directly in the intervention, maybe they're in higher level or level decisions and they, they use that information differently than the data science team that's kind of actively tuning the model. And yeah. And then one day the, the other audience would be maybe the model itself, right? Where it's kind of taking these, I haven't fully, you know, mental modeled this one out yet, but the idea would be it, it would be able to kind of learn from the results of the experimentation and measurement in some format, right? It, some form of input into the system. You know, we kind of all, often in these things, you have multiple kind of diff, models and heuristics kind of interacting with each other, right? And and some part of that could be things from, from experimentation and measurement, experiment results, seeing what works on who. Um, but that's that's definitely... It's important to do it, I think, manually first before you get into that. I would, I would recommend doing it like, you know, looking at the results and then doing it, uh, before you kind of close that loop. I think that's somewhat of a, a, like, I guess, common kind of staging of the things and makes sense in a lot of regards. So, yeah. So that's kind of, I guess, the, the, the main benefits is you can learn quickly, you know, our, you can definitely, uh, tune, you know, the, the length of your experiments and things to fit your use case. Ours are, our offers are refreshed weekly. You get new offers weekly. So that kind of is a built in cadence for us. That's quite nice. So we can do different experiments weekly, although sometimes we do want to run them for multiple weeks. If we're like, well, maybe market conditions, we don't feel like we can get super reliable results. Or sometimes there's an intervention we're aware of, like that might impact our results from the larger business. Maybe there's some sort of other offer or promotion going on that's just across everybody and we can't like we don't know you know we can't we don't have that fine-tuned control so maybe some weeks are less reliable than others so we you know take all that into account but yeah that's that's kind of uh another thing to consider as well great great so uh I've heard about this particular like approach which is being used quite extensively like the Bayesian approach is like mainly used for discussing measurement frameworks so like mm -hmm. could you provide a high level overview of what this method is and how it can be applied to effectively use in measurement frameworks so yeah so Bayesian is a uh, Bayesian inference is kind of an approach to the measurement piece right so the idea is in, in these systems you really should look at it as a way that your experiment piece is, is one piece and you definitely need to consider what your experiment is when you're doing measurement. Uh, but at the same time, you you know, you can run experiments and perform Bayesian inference. And the most common alternative is it's frequent and frequentest inference on results uh, from the same on data generated from the same experiment. So it kind of comes, it's that after the effect of how are we inferring, you know, the lift from this, this, you know, experiment, the, the, you know, offer A versus offer B, those sorts of things. How are we measuring which one's working better and by how much, how sure are we of this? That's kind of statistical inference, right? And Bayesian and the, the kind of common alternative is, is frequentist inference are, are common approaches to this. So to provide a bit of background on that. So frequentist inference is, is kind of the one that you've, uh, most people learn in kind of their first statistics course. It's kind of the one with the p-values, the significance tests, the confidence intervals, um, and and Bayesian's kind of an alternative for for doing that sort of thing, where you're trying to see, okay, I have this data, I have these groups, these variants, I want to see. It's not just for groups and variants. So you can use Bayesian models for prediction. You can use them for all sorts of things. But speaking specifically in inference for for these sorts of problems, you know, is A performing better than B by how much? How sure are we of this, etc. Right. So uh, what I find, so the, the difference between the two is, is kind of, it's, it's hard to describe. It's quite philosophical in nature is, is my kind of take on it. I'm, I'm still, again, I, I have a background in stats, but even some of this, like definitely when I was in school confused me, I'm like, what is the difference exactly? But I've definitely done some reading, you know, after the fact and kind of the, the, the I, I think what's most important is understanding kind of 
the consequences of the difference because it is kind of a philosophical difference about what probability is. Frequent just looks at long term and Bayesian kind of has this belief and belief updating. Or, sorry, frequent just looks at long run kind of frequencies as, as probability. You know, you can think of like proportions or that sort of thing. Um, and, and Bayesian looks at it as, as kind of uncertainty and quantifying that around uh, uh, beliefs, updating beliefs. There's kind of a different procedure for that. So in general, though, the, the key consequences of this, and I don't think I explained that totally properly either. It's kind of, uh, but the key consequences, I think, are more important than uh, the exact uh, philosophical differences, um, because the idea is in, in uh, so in all forms of inference, right, you have things data you observe and you have parameters or or kind of thingies you i don't know what to call like variables that you don't observe right and that's what you're trying to measure is is what you don't observe you're trying to approximate it you want to understand what approximately this value is and what are other values it could be what's its range of possible values based on this data right um so the idea is and also in in statistics in general you have this notion of of fixed variables and random variables. Fixed variables are are known and random variables follow some sort of pro probability distribution, right? So kind of the key consequences are kind of break down from these things. So uh, that at least what I find to be some of the key consequences. So in frequentist uh, inference, your, your parameters are fixed. So the unknown things are uh, uh, fixed and it's fixed. So like, for instance, you're trying to estimate, you know, the 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 mean or the difference in mean between mean i don't know spend between variance a and b the the mean of a mean of b the true values are are unknown um and they're kind of from some you you think of them as from some overarching larger sometimes described as infinite uh population right you hear about the term population right and we are observing uh, then the data is Basically, you're observing a mere sample from that population. And that that data comes from something called a sampling distribution. That's kind of the distribution the data follows and, and that sort of thing, right? And then the inference is where you approximate the parameters. So you kind of come up with a approximation of the parameters from the data. And the uncertainty comes from that sampling distribution because it's a random sample from that overarching sample distribution or from that overarching, yeah, sort of thing. So in Bayesian, it's flipped. You have the parameters uh, being random and the data being fixed. And to me, this is a bit more intuitive um, and, and to, to many people as well, because, you know, you the you the random parameters means, you know, we don't know. We think it follows some distribution, but we're not sure. And uh, the observed data is fixed. We've seen it. It is what it is. There's nothing random about it, but we're trying to use it to infer these parameters that we we don't know. And the idea is you kind of, with Bayesian inference, you start with some notion of maybe what these parameters could be, then you use data to update, the, that's called a prior distribution, and then you, uh, and that's a probable distribution, yeah, of what they could be, and you update the distribution for the parameters uh, using the observed data to, to create something called the posterior distribution, which is essentially the distribution for the parameters given the data. So the the key idea in, in that sense is that you, um, like, or I guess the key advantages that kind of come from that is uh, the, the Bayesian approach, I should say, is it, it can kind of clearly communicate answers in ways the frequentist approach can't because you kind of have what you're estimating kind of flipped and reversed in a sense, right? So when you think about something like a p-value, right? The p-value, in frequentist inference is the the probability of the of observing the data uh given the uh sorry uh, i'm getting this backwards uh i always write this down because i always forget it yeah the probability of observing the data given the you know your null hypothesis so given there's no difference between a and b right so given your null hypothesis is true right and uh, the thing is, you cannot flip that around and say, what's the probability that we are seeing a, uh, you know, different or we are seeing like A being different than B, right? So that basically because it's a probability of the data, given the null hypothesis is true and you can't just say, okay, then one minus that is the probability of the data given the null hypothesis is false. So if you have a p-value of 4%, you can't say, 
okay, that means the data given the hypothesis, the probability of observing the data given the hypothesis, you know, 4%, we can't just say it's 96% that we'd observe this data given the null hypothesis is not true. So given A is bigger than B or given A is not equal to B, that sort of thing, right? Uh, because, you know, you can't split conditional probabilities like that. Because Bayesian inference kind of takes that opposite approach. The the posterior is, is the probability of, you can call it the hypothesis, the parameters are, the hypothesis is a function of the parameters, right? So the probability of the parameters is a function of it given the data. You can very easily infer those results from that. So there's a lot of intuition that, that can come from the Bayesian approach uh, that isn't available otherwise. Um, and it's also a fair bit more flexible is, is what I found. So you can definitely model a lot more complex things, different things, things that would be somewhat illegal, I guess, in the frequentist approach, models, that sort of thing, uh, you can make in the Bayesian approach. And what I like about it is your, um, your, your kind of, your, your assumptions of your model, there's, it's not canned statistical p procedures like the frequentist where you do this statistical test, this and this and this. And if those, you know, are, you know, not statistically significant or are, or depending on the thing you're trying to do, then you can do this test and that will come with your results. And it's kind of following this tree of decision sort of thing. Whereas Beijing, you kind of build a model that's in terms of probability distributions, you define what your assumptions about the model are, what your assumptions about the data are. Um, you define something called the likelihood as well, which is similar, looks often similar to frequent dislikelihood. So that's how you can end up with things like regressions in, in the Bayesian paradigm and that sort of thing. Um, and then you can, uh, but you can do all sorts of things. You can build different levels to it and layers, but those are kind of your assumptions or, are what's laid out in the model. Um, so there's nothing kind of hidden. Frequentist, you do have to make sure you're meeting all the model assumptions. So I like that about it as well. Um, but it's definitely not always the right approach, always for the faint of heart. It is more computationally expensive. That's why you haven't heard of maybe, you know, 30 years ago, it really wasn't feasible in a lot of cases, right? Because the idea is to compute that posterior distribution without getting too much into the math with words, because I feel like that's like probably an easy way to confuse everybody, because I know I have trouble when, you know, verbally hearing math. <laughs> but the idea is in Bayes, it, the, the term Bayesian comes from Bayes' theorem, which essentially defines the update procedure uh, for the that you use to get your to get basically a posterior from your likelihood and your prior and there's a denominator so there's there's the likelihood and the prior but then you have to divide it by something called a marginal distribution which is essentially the only way to get that from your model is is integrating out um, the parameters out of kind of that product of the the prior and likelihood that and the issue is that becomes a very computationally expensive integral that's often intractable. So the idea is that there's kind of, you have to kind of find ways to get that, that marginal. There are some for, there are some limited sets of cases where you can have a closed form for your posterior. Uh, these are called conjugate priors often in the exponential family where you kind of get, uh, where you have a nice closed form and you're like, oh, it becomes this distribution when I combine this prior and this likelihood, but then you're quite limited. Um, so often what you do is you kind of end up using uh, or because you that the data is fixed in Bayesian inference and that denominator is actually just a function of data. You can treat it somewhat as a fixed normalizing constant and uh, you can basically use your your likelihood and prior generate uh, uh, samples from it and use kind of a Markov chain using Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, methods is, is kind of without getting too much into that detail. So that is, uh, yeah, the, from a high level, that's kind of the approach. So you end up with a set of samples from this posterior distribution generated from your, your Markov chain Monte Carlo typically method. There are other forms to do it, but MCMC is the one where you're kind of guaranteed a convergence after a certain number of steps. Of course, who knows that number of steps could be, you know, take centuries to, to reach if, if you're, you know, starting out with such a vague model with a bunch of parameters and nothing, you know, it can be intractable, even if it's theoretically, you're, you theoretically have convergence, it's, it still might never happen. Uh, so you do need to be careful with that. So yeah, there is quite a bit more work, you do need to understand probability distributions, what they mean, that sort of thing. Uh, when doing uh, Bayesian inference, frequentist inference, you 
you, you should know what's going on under the hood as well. You know, there are ways to do a quick and simple dirty tea test or whatever. And it, it can be quite robust if you're kind of just testing two groups, want to know what it is, et cetera. I actually use it in assignment to do something called AA testing. I don't, I don't know if I have time to get into that, but it's, it's a way to just make sure the groups are very approximately balanced after kind of randomizing the sampling and assignment between treatment and control, that sort of thing. Um, but so there, there's, there's definitely cases to do it. It's a lot computationally cheaper, that sort of thing. But if you're looking for kind of more information, there's a lot more information you can get from Bayesian modeling. And there's a lot more, um, uh, I guess, complex things you can, you can model. And, and, and in some cases, which actually ended up being my, my case with the type of thing I was working towards in my current role, uh, it kind of ended up being kind of the only case that really worked with the, the complexity we had. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the overarching of it. Um, yeah, both, both are good approaches. So then you should kind of, uh, Bayesian and Freak with this, you should kind of be aware of both if you're going to get into this because it, there are cases where one versus the other makes more sense and, and you need to be aware of that. Um, yeah. Got it. Got it. So my next question, Vanessa, so how do you ensure that the measurement framework you build is robust and reliable? And what are some of the key considerations or challenges you face in this process of building these kind of sophisticated models? Yeah, so definitely. So there's kind of, yeah, again, the two sides of it, the experimentation and measurement from the experimentation side. Um, you definitely want to make sure yeah, you're considering your experiments first and um designing them in a way that you're not kind of confounding itself. So one thing uh, I do, and this isn't even necessary. So the idea is, right, you have this notion of a random sample, right, often in statistics. You want to make sure your experiments are are kind of create a random sample as much as you can. Often, in, you know, we do have business rules. We, you know, don't want people to be in this variant for two weeks in a row or something. We have rules where we need people to to be moving around, that sort of thing. Like you do have kind of interventions to take away a bit from randomness, but still within that, you want them as random as possible. But you also want some balance, right? So that's where I do something called AA testing, which I had mentioned earlier, and that does involve a, a, a quick t-test when I'm doing that kind of automated um, assignment piece uh, that assigns customers to, you know, different variants and that sort of thing. In reality, it's not A and B. We have A, B, C, D, whatever, We, you know, all the way down. Um, and kind of, it's more like, subsets like a1 b a, you know that a2 that sort of thing and things are crossing and yeah, there's lots going on but um so the idea is within kind of each of these units to kind of make sure that the main comparisons i'll, I'll want to make in measurement the name variants i'll want to compare there's approximate balance you know again this is a very simple t-test that's kind of i i create like a you know kind of a pretty good simple metric that's kind of a combination of of different kpis kind of look at it's a very simple dimensionality reduction problem. Again, you don't want this to be computationally expensive, but because you're going to need to maybe do it multiple times. And the idea is you uh, check, you know, with your balancing metric or whatever, basically, okay, I want groups to be balanced with this. I run the, you know, uh, so I quickly do a t-test to see, oh, and by the way, those, those metrics or whatever typically computed off previous data we have on the customer or that sort of thing, right? So oftentimes, if you're working on new customers and acquisitions, this isn't something obviously you can do, but if it's, you know, for us, we have, it's loyalty. We have a history of people's, you know, how much they, you know, spend with us, that sort of thing, how often they visit the store, just, you know, basic interactions they've done with their loyalty card. So we can kind of come up with uh, a metric that kind of says, okay, this, this person's kind of uh, overall balancing of all these metrics is at this level, this person's at, at you know a, a five this person's at a three and we want to make sure you know we don't have you know variant a having all the threes and variant b having all the five you know that sort of thing like to put it very simply right we don't we want to make sure that you have somewhat equivalent customers uh, so we kind of re-randomize until basically that t-test shows no significant difference between the two groups with respect to that metric oftentimes it's only one uh test especially with larger groups randomization is is a powerful tool and typically in these larger sizes uh uh push itself out correctly but yeah that's something we do on that side to make sure at least we have some approximate balance this isn't always possible if you're doing online experiments uh you know that can't be done because 
often because you're kind of doing that at, at, at runtime sort of thing, uh, depending on the type of experiment you're running. And, you know, again, with new people or you're checking out, yeah, people you don't have past information on can't be done. So it's, it's definitely not in every case, but if that's something you can do, it was honestly something more in a sense to, to make everyone feel more assured in the results. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was helpful. Then from the measurement point of view, so if you're going with the, the either approach, frequency and frequent, just make sure you know what you're, you're, you know, what you're doing. Make sure you know the model you're applying, why you're applying it and what it's doing. Uh, I've seen a lot of things just applied blindly, um, in the past. Uh, whether it's frequent or Bayesian methods, frequent is especially because you have kind of this baked in set of assumptions you need for these different models. And some are more important than others. Um, and it's sometimes not entirely clear which ones are more important than others. Um, but if you're violating some key assumptions, your, your results can be nonsensical. That is again, why I, I do like Bayesian because, you know, I mean, you do need to define the correct probability distributions for your, for your model and your approach and your data. But, um, for your priors and your likelihoods, whatever, but it, that, that is your assumptions, uh, essentially, right? Aside from the fact, that, you know, you want a random sample, you want all these kind of standard things, uh, on the experiment side. But, uh, aside from that, uh, that would be kind of a, a way this can go wrong. So yeah, make sure you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Make sure you know why you're applying the, inf- the, the approach to inference you're applying and, and, what kind of assumptions you're supposed to have going in. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that, that would be a huge thing. And then, then the other thing is too, if you're doing repeated experiments, if you're doing something where, or you're doing multiple at once, you know, we kind of divide ours across different things, the uh, regions or parts of the country, banners, we have all sorts of different things going on. So there was not really one experiment. There's tons, right? And even within these experiments, we have different variants and those variants will vary that sort of thing. And, when you're at this level of complexity, uh, there, there needs to be like the, the communication essentially between the experiment and measurement piece needs to be automated, robust and reliable. You really need to think of it as a software design problem is the, the approach that I found that's made things a lot easier for me. You need things to be configurable. You need things to be testable. You need to unit test your code. You need to test your model and in, ba- in Bayesian inference, for example, you can definitely it's Bayesian approaches are actually really nice for simulation. You can simulate data from, let's say, you know, create a simulated model, whether you simulate data and you're like, oh, okay, I know what the results are. Let's see what this is looking like in a case where I've kind of created this, this toy model, this toy data and know the results. Is it coming up with, you know, reasonable things? And also you can do kind of, there's things called prior predictive simulation where you uh, simulate just from your priors, ignoring the data, um, sort of thing and kind of see if your uh, priors are, are generating results that are reasonable, if they're eliminating results that uh, are unreasonable. So that's a big thing with, with priors is people get nervous about them in the sense that, oh, I'm baking in these, you know, assumptions. I'm saying things about these parameters before I've seen the data. It, it, it's a starting point. Most priors are diffuse, meaning quite flat, high variability, that sort of thing. So uh, it, you, the idea is you, you kind of, uh, but the one thing you don't want is to have probability zero assigned to something unless you're sure that's actually impossible because that will cause your, basically you, you can't reach that. Anything else with enough data, your posterior can, can reach. It might be harder. Um, but you, from that approach, you know, as long as you're not setting things to zero, you, you do look at it as more of a, uh, how would I put it? Like a, uh, a model, a tuning sort of step, like a, a tuning your sampler. Sometimes it's like a starting point and also kind of, uh, performing the shape of the parameters, that sort of thing and the, the relationships between them. Uh, but yeah, so the, the idea is to make sure all of that's making sense when you have a lot of parameters in a complex model and it's hard to reason about each parameter individually because there's so much going on. Prior predictive simulation, you can essentially simulate results. Uh, from your model, um, and, uh, uh, see if it's generating reasonable values or if it's in generating insane values, if it's missing out on some values that you think it should have. Those are things you can do to check if your, your Bayesian model's making sense. Uh, and yeah, frequent just test the assumptions. And with both, you can always simulate data 
where you know the results. I know A is going to be bigger than B. I know it's going to be this much bigger ish. You know, see what the, your your model's saying uh, based on your input. You know, again, with simple A versus B, you typically don't need to do this. But when you have kind of these kind of factors, if you're you know engaging in anything with a regression model, a hierarchical model, which is what I tend to, why I kind of have gone to the the Bayesian route is those are quite powerful models and and great with the Bayesian approach, but it's hard to individually visualize the priors and stuff. So that sort of thing can, can definitely help. Um, yeah. So definitely good software design. I think I said that with, with the unit testing and that, uh, you, you, you want to make sure, yeah, you know what you're doing. And then also I've noticed, you know, sometimes people use pre-built solutions. So this is more, if you're not in my role, but if you're someone who wants results, but you don't have, you know, a person with the, a statistic background to do this, just be very careful with canned solutions is all I'll say. Uh, be aware of, of what they've canned and what they're doing. Um, and if that actually makes sense, a lot of the times canned solutions will, will, will be a t-test, which are both robust but limiting. So I think in that sense, they're quite safe. You know, you you it can fail to take into account similarities between variants and, and information sharing. So there's kind of a little bit of an information loss, but it, it, you know, for just comparing groups, 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 uh, it, it can do that to 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 a somewhat reasonable degree, but you can't really extrapolate much or say, okay, my t-test is saying this. This means I I can expand this to, uh, you know, we're this percent sure this is better than this with respect to this KPI. It's a lot harder to combine KPIs, uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, Bayesian results kind of make that easier as well. You can. Uh, kind of have a multi-layered model in that sense as well with respect to outcomes. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess be careful with canned solutions if they are doing anything complicated and if they're doing a t-test and your approach is simple, that, that's fine. I, but just be aware of what they're doing and, and look it up if you have kind of a, a pre-built out-of-the-box solution uh, is another kind of warning, I guess. Right. So in terms of uh, productionalization like and bringing MLOps into practice for these kind of experimentation, so uh, I mm-hmm. feel it makes much sense if we are able to automate it in a much better way, like in the way MLOps actually says, because it's essentially hard, like pulling some data for some analysis and then doing some handwritten logic or like handwritten analysis at the at the runtime. Like it's it's pretty complex because the volume will be different, the mm-hmm. processing will be different, everything will be actually different at the time. So, how hard is to actually deploy these kind of experimentations into the production and continuously monitor and how is that process looking like actually in the real world? Yeah, so, so it definitely takes some time. So, you know, maybe, uh, so it depends again, if you're working with a, a machine learning system like myself, which I, I think tends to be at least a good ground zero for these sorts of cases, especially, if, you know, uh, yeah, in terms of experimentation, I guess, because you're able to kind of work with the team where you're, uh, I don't know, you have access to the data and you have access to kind of a machine learning infrastructure because it is, some of the infrastructure requirements are, are quite similar in terms of metadata tracking for that sort of thing of, of your model, of your, uh, yeah, I guess like kind of the, the, especially if you've gone Bayesian and with that more complex approach, you do have kind of very similar notions to machine learning models in terms of hyperparameters, uh, a fit or in Bayesian sampling inference process, right? And you're going to have metadata resulting from that kind of process. You're going to probably want to serialize and save that model to use it again. And you're going to want to store that because you're going to probably have multiple ones in a, in a known fashion. So definitely if you have a machine learning team, if you're working with one leverage, you know, what they're using for ML ops for, for measurement and experimentation can be a good way to go. So we're, we use MLflow and Databricks, so I use MLflow and Databricks. There's definitely different considerations. For instance, Bayesian scaling is not scale like to, to large sets of data is not scaled the same way, uh, and not maybe as easily. Although I don't think machine learning scaling is easily. I just think there's been I don't I, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's uh, I guess right nowadays you there's a lot of automation of of parallelization and and that sort of thing, right? You can kind of take out that complexity. We're not we're not there yet with with Bayesian sampling. Um, there is a, there is a, a critical mass of data where you won't be able to do kind of Bayesian sampling the way I or Bayesian inference the way I've described it. Uh, there are approaches to do it with big data. 
um, but compromises do need to be made at, at certain parts or, or it requires some, some pretty, uh, deep thoughted theory and there's not really out of the box packages available for that yet. Um, there's, there's certain things coming. I think that isn't a, per, a, a part of the, uh, world, I guess that's, that's coming to be, but yeah, but going to kind of the whole experimentation framework. So yeah, you want something that's configurable, meaning that you have like, you know, so yeah, we have, you know, a lot of places have their things divided up between different regions, groups, etc. because, you know, different teams are responsible for this. There's different business logic in different places. Maybe you're conducting different experiments across different, you know, areas. Like I don't want to roll this out nationwide. I just want to try it here, see how they react to it. This is our key test market. And then we'll start to roll it out more places like that sort of thing. So you're going to have that. And then even within those, again, you have all those different variants of treatment, you know, for us, these are different offer types, right? You know, the, the different ones I've spoken about, you know, certain products, buy this many, get this, uh, you know, uh, different levels of riches. You have all these kind of different variants that are kind of nested within each other or even crossed, you know, customers get multiple versions. You might even have different types of, uh, you know, systems or offers for us, for example, that you're testing. So there's all sorts of different things going on at, at the same time. Um, and, uh, you, you can't measure each of those. Like you can't go through each individually and, and manually build a model for each. There's just way too many. Um, in terms of on the, uh, treatment side or the treatment variant side, uh, you can work to build, you know, a model. That's where the Bayesian approach is helpful that kind of captures kind of the nuances of these, these different variants. So you can kind of see each kind of the most granular level of the customer experience, but also kind of drill up into their, um, I guess, less great, uh, like, you know, you have kind of, okay, I have this type of offer, this type of offer, this type of offer. And then I also have just like, you know, kind of if you have a control and no offer or something, right. And then you kind of are comparing all those different things to each other. You're comparing this variant combined with this variant versus this variant combined with this variant, that sort of thing. That That's something that the Bayesian model helps capture. But in terms of doing it across all these different independent groups and regions and that, um, at a certain point, and especially because there's kind of different conditions and stuff, you are going to have multiple models and multiple things going on at the same time. So that's why configuration is such a point. You don't want separate code for each of these. You really... If you find yourself copy pasting a block of code and slightly modifying it and then like saying that's the next, that's not a good way to do anything. That's why, I mean, I definitely don't come from, I guess, an academic software development background. Like my, my background is math and stats and a lot of my background or a lot of my school was just doing things in notebooks, you know, whether it's in R or, or Python or whatever. And, and that was kind of what I was doing. It was, things were made for one off runs, but in industry, things are often not one-off runs. Sometimes you are doing things that are one-off runs, uh, where it's these long-run experiments. You're you're running once every six months. Then it's fine to keep it like that. But if you're doing kind of these very regular things, and you're wanting to, uh, you know, kind of ha- be able to very flexibly do all this at once, it takes quite a build out, and it does take some time thinking about software design. Definitely, you know, you if you're on a team like mine, you can definitely consult with other people who are maybe more well-versed and come from that background. I've learned from a lot of different people and then also just kind of learned, you know, online and things kind of filling that gap, I guess, that I, because I did, you know, some computer science classes in school, but not uh, like enterprise software development or anything like, you know, design, architecture, that sort of thing or anything like that. It was just, you know, how to write code essentially. And then you're kind of, you know, doing the mathier side of that, which is interesting and helpful. And you learn about, uh, and even like did some data structures, algorithms, but not, uh, that, that at least for me, that architecture piece didn't really come into play. So in, in school. So that's something that I've had to definitely learn. And I think that'll be the case. I, I, I think maybe there's, there's some programs that go through both in terms of the heavy stats required for, uh, the Bayesian, you know, inference or for the, these sorts of cases, uh, or to really get deep into the frequentist models as well, but while also kind of having, the the software development piece but I, I imagine it's probably a double major or something but that so and my point of saying that is you don't need traditional school i've i've tried i've learned it on the go i'm definitely like i look back at code i wrote six months ago and i'm like i don't like that anymore you know take the time to refactor but 
the idea is you want something modular, something configurable, you know, you want these configurations, like in terms of what the experiments are, what the areas are, where you're running what, it's all kind of be outside the code, you know, stage one is, is YAML files or JSON files or whatever, defining those configurations. And maybe eventually we, we end up, if you're kind of, there's an investment in a desire with a UI of some sorts where people can actually, you know, interact with your system uh, directly. It doesn't have to be you or someone going into your, you know, configuration files and changing it that way, but having it configurable in that way is, is a really important building block uh, for these sorts of things. Um, and with your models too, they, this is where it would be more similar. So that's kind of both the experiments, kind of configuring the experiments and then also having it in that standard structure that allows experimentation and measurement to communicate with each other through that kind of standardized configurable structure. It knows what's been done. It knows what comparisons are of interest. Those were taken account during the experiment design or assign, you know, vary in assignment phase, what have you. And now during measurement, that those same things are, are readable and, and taken into account. So those, that is a really, I think, important piece that has made this possible for me. Um, but yeah, and then, yeah, in terms of, yeah, you're going to have basic models can be tricky. There's a lot of, again, parallels with machine learning models, but in a lot of cases you do kind of, you end up, if you're trying to do something complicated, you do end up having to do it. So you you, you want to make sure you're kind of, keep, yeah, saving those models, keeping track of them, making sure there's different measures of fit of a Bayesian model to see if you're done sampling, you want to keep track of those, make sure that's working correctly. Um, and yeah, and serialize the model so you can sample from it, so you can generate predictions from it, so you can use it for inference. Um, that's that's a really important piece as well. So, uh, and that would take more of a similar to MLOps, I think, approach where you kind of have this model at the core and you have a, a fit, you know, and based in its, its sampling and things. But you have some stage where you're kind of building it out, fitting it, you know, getting it ready to, to be able to perform some form of, you know, inference and results and things. And then you want to save that format because it maybe took a little bit of time, right, to, to, to you know, uh, sample from or fit or whatever, right? And then you save that and, uh, uh, you know, and you want to be able to query it, you want to be able to version it, you maybe even want to be able to compare different versions, like maybe you include this variable, maybe you don't, maybe you treat this variable as a higher cool variable, maybe you don't, maybe you, you know, so you want to keep track of all those things. That's where, yeah, very similar infrastructure to ML ops, like we, yeah, we're, we've been using ML flow, uh, uh, can really help with that. Uh, so that's kind of another uh, another piece.